thank you for having this second conversation with me. Uh, just to set the preface, and then we're going to just jump into collaboration and exploring where this conversation takes us. Uh, since our last conversation, I've had multiple of the things you've said um, just kind of reverberate within me and twisting and turning, especially around what you coined body-friendly language, which I really liked as a term, um, but also talking about, we did have some Zen talk the last time and the non-doing and all of that. So all of those have been kind of in the in the back of my mind. And I would love to just have a conversation around the body-friendly language and also how it intersects with clean, how it's different from clean, because I see clear kind of mindset similarities, but also technical differences in ho also how I am exploring that for my own courses. And I would just love to explore that today with you, both from my side and from your side. Okay. And from my side, I'm very interested the, that you're putting somatic work, you are a body worker as well as the other things you do, putting that together with parts work and so on. Mm -hmm. um, and if I can uh, ask you any questions or explore... Do, you, you can ask me as many questions as you want. collaborative <laughs> way. Just to, yeah, because this is a project which we're both pursuing in our own ways. And I'm delighted that you're interested in the clean language approach. Mm -hmm. And as I, as I said, the, um, in, in trying to, you know, I, I first trained in shiatsu, Zen shiatsu, and other kinds of Japanese energy-based body work. Um, and then I discovered the clean language. And in trying to fit those two things together, not so easy at, at, at first, but I just realized that actually that you need some other kinds of language, which I eventually started calling body friendly language to make the place, make the space safe, make, uh, mm -hmm. give the client the sense that this is their space. It's not, I'm the super expert and you're the miserable victim <laughs> of your suffering and I'll sort you out. It's completely the opposite of that. Mm -hmm. um, which is common to many of mo most approaches to therapy these days, I say. Um, and then combining the actual words, the, the language itself, with as acute a sense of what you can feel in what's going on in the field between you. So you could call it body-friendly language. I would also kind of call it trauma-friendly language. Mm -hmm. sooner or later if you ask the, qu the questions in the right way then you're gonna bump into the stuff that is in the way of this person connecting with their truest most authentic vital sense mm -hmm. of self which is coming back to what you kind of do mm -hmm. i i really find it interesting what you're saying there because um, so I, I wouldn't use the term trauma friendly. I would have, I, I use the term trauma sensitive. So it's trauma sensitive language and it's trauma sensitive body work and somatic work that, that I've been exploring a lot. And I, I think, so this is even before I ran into clean this, the, the questions you're raising have been there for me and my own terminology before before exploring the clean stuff was always how can we have an in the moment exploration of experience and trying to facilitate that and that's actually where i see the biggest overlap with clean like clean is basically an in the moment exploration of somebody's either somatic or symbolic or a potentially even cognitive experience to some degree uh, and i find actually that some of the clean perspectives and especially some of the questions that have widened my vocabulary have been super helpful. But at the same time, and especially in the way of coaching and body work, I, I am exploring, it's not, just, it's not just about unfolding experience, but there are certain moments where it needs different tools, where for instance, it may need regulation tools and it may need uh, specific exercises, experiments that actually help us uh, connect to the body in a way that is not just not purely coming from the client, but where I give inspiration or instruction. 
but then return to the exploration of, and having done this, what happens now? Because then it's again me stepping back and not just not saying, and you're more regulated now, but it's giving the instruction and then exploring. Yeah. So, so those have always been the kind of things I've tried to do as cleanly as possible. And at the same time, figuring out how to use language differently in both of these cases. So that, that's been kind of my personal exploration and trying to make that work because it's not so easy. It's really tricky how to, how to use language there and also how to be able to teach other people how to use language in those, in those ways. Yeah, I guess that simplest, um, clean question, what's happening now? Mm -hmm. um, is uh, is a kind of bridge between the two, the body friendly language, the which is kind of full of instructions or um, suggestions or invitations, directions, um, a bridge between that and the clean language, which is as much as possible handing everything over to the client. But it's their own in a landscape. It's their exploration. It's their experience, which by definition, I as the practitioner can never understand. Can you know um, that, that those two ends of the spectrum? I guess you could say. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah, so in my mind, thinking quite visually, it's then that's the Venn diagram where we have the clean, where we have the body friendly, and where the connection or one of the connections is what's happening now, or yeah. and as did 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 what are you noticing in your body? Those those kind of questions. Yeah. And um, again, from the, the body friendly side, what do you notice in your body is, is a direction to the body. It might not be appropriate for everyone in a mm -hmm. pure, clean world. Somebody might not want to be directed to their body. And that's another bit about the, the permission uh, always, and this is not easy, <laughs> always um, doing your best to, to hand that permission mm -hmm. over to the client so that anything that you say that doesn't work for them they can immediately report that back to you rather mm -hmm. than um feeling that it's not okay for them to tell you that something isn't working because of that power imbalance you know mm -hmm. which is another aspect of what we're talking about really is how how best can we share this power collaboratively while at the same time, as you say, they're paying you or they're paying me for one's expertise for some help, which which we do need to be able to deliver. I, so multiple things in what you've just said are very interesting. The one thing I'm really drawn to is that permission to go to the body. Yeah. So the permission to ask a question and... Uh, and da -da -da, what's happening now, or even more specifically, what's happening now in your body, or what are you noticing in your body, uh, is something that needs to be part of the agreement of the coaching bodywork therapeutic agreement is we want to explore or include the body. Is that something you're drawn to? And if it ever doesn't fit for you, please tell me. But at the same time, I will include that because that's part of what we have agreed upon mm. at the beginning of a session or at the beginning of a, of a, a session package. Well, if they've come to see you or they've come to see me, they presumably know that body work of some kind is at least potentially part of the package. Uh, yeah, absolutely. Um, but because I did some training in kind of hypnotherapy trance kind of work with uh, Steve Gilligan, who's a real master of that stuff. Um, you know, I, I did sort of start making a map in my mind of what are the things we do with body friendly language. And I, I don't know if people listening to this would like a couple of examples, but so, so I think I think we might even have the question of so what the hell is body friendly language, <laughs> <laughs> and what do we do with it? <laughs> exactly. So. Anybody who's listened to any kind of guided meditation online or in a retreat or whatever, you no doubt have noticed that the, the facilitator will, will begin with some kind of invitation or direction to bring 
your attention to yourself to settle down to um, bring your attention to your feet to your sitting bones to the sense of the weight of your body and as I start saying all these things it's impossible not to start thinking about them so that very subtle first step of hypno therapeutic language as soon as you mention something the mind has to go there if i ask you how you know how you feeling in your lower back your mind has to go there um so that that's the first principle with any kind of um therapeutic language where are we directing the client's attention mm-hmm. and i'm sure that's the same for you that the attention is the p- most powerful tool that we have in our work. Whether we're bringing attention through touch to a particular place in the body, whether we're doing it through language, whether we're simply doing it by noticing non-verbally that something's happening in the other person's body or energy field. These are all ways that we're kind of bringing attention to what's and going on. So. so- Number one, when you speak of hypnotherapy, I, I do. I have been trained. I have trained a bit in hypnotherapy too. So, uh, just the the language patterns of it. Also, not just not bring your attention to your feet, bring your attention to your legs, but and bring your attention to your feet. And then, so how do we link it? How do we make it easy for somebody to follow that, but also make it invitational enough that they could say no so that it's not do that um and the the other thing you were just oh i forgot my second point that was i had a really good one sad <laughs> um, oh yeah you were speaking of where we guide attention and i also find it's not just where we guide attention but how hmm. so that it's that it's a difference of Uh, can you move your attention towards your feet or can you sense your feet or can you go into your feet or can you uh, can you focus on your feet or can you settle into your feet all of these are very 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 different invitations and i find that clients are very precise in what they do they will usually try to do exactly what we tell them and if we tell them to go into their feet it's a difference than can you sense your feet yeah and they will usually either try to do exactly what we tell them or resist what we tell them because it's not fitting which is very welcome but so it's not just where do we guide it but also how yeah yeah and i think also having studied mindfulness in a in a formal way, mindfulness-based cognitive therapy. That's a very interesting area in in relation to body-friendly language because um, mindfulness, the mindfulness course is taught to anybody. You can come to that course with no particular interest in connecting with your body. There are various ways in which you're invited to do that. Um, but over the years since they sort of started rolling it out as a as a actual approved a treatment for depression and things like that um you know they found resistance from people or people just i mean for example if if you use the word the instruction or the request is it okay to stay with that feeling um sometimes they find people just asking what do you mean stay with that which you know people in the body work field think well well, that's pretty obvious isn't it just stay with (laughs) me but but actually for somebody who's not used to connecting with their body what do you mean stay with that it it's a really basic fundamental question and we have to step back you know as body work people and realize hey we're in a different world here um and and word the instructions in a way that really works for people, as well as, as you say, giving them permission to do it or not do it, or find their own way to do it. Uh, so, yeah, in terms of, like, I, I was just putting, looking at some inductions, as they say, uh, um, just in preparation. This is, this is one that a very, very, very experienced 
mindfulness teacher used uh, recently in an online gathering of other mindfulness teachers. So it's, it's already a little bit advanced, you could say. The first thing she said was something along the lines of meeting yourself with kindness. Now that's okay if you're talking to a whole bunch of body, of my of mindfulness teachers. I mean, that's Every, kind of kind of the most okay thing to say, meeting yourself with kindness. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Um, but but from the clean point of view, clean language point of view, you have all these people in this meeting thinking that they all know that that what that means for each other. Everybody's kindness is their own kindness. That, you know, what kind of kindness, you might ask, if you're asking a clean question. And then she says, choosing a place to rest your attention. So we're coming back to this key thing of attention and offering choice. Choosing a place to rest your attention. Widening your attention from that anchor point right out to the edges of your body. So there she's making a presupposition that the place you've chosen to rest your attention is in your body. It could, you know, one of the trauma sensitive or trauma friendly processes, I mean, steps that you can obviously take in any meditation is to invite people to put their attention somewhere in the room or, you know, to a sound, whatever. But anyway, widening your attention from that anchor point, which is a metaphor, right out to the edges of your body. And again, some people might find that quite challenging. You know, what do you mean the edges of it, my body? It's, it's also the text, edge, edges of the body is also in one way, we could look at it as this, but it could also be a metaphor of where are the edges of my body? Well, yeah, that's a central question in all kinds of therapy. Where are my boundaries? Yeah. yeah. Um, taking in the texture of things, the temperature of the air, the sense of your clothes on your skin. Um, and then she takes a quantum leap, uh, include a sense of this community, breathing the same air, connecting to the same earth. And these are all beautiful um, invitations, actually instructions in this case. And we all, we all use them, I think. But it, it gives you a kind of menu of possibilities there, I'd say. And, and as you were saying, the, the, the uh, quality or kind of attention that one is to bring. She starts off with a kindness as the quality there. That might be over the top for some people. Uh, if you're very depressed, kindness is the last thing you know how to bring to yourself, for example. But um, spacious attention might be like or <laughs> simple attention you know you have to fit it for the person but that that's just a, an example of of what we're talking about when we're i guess when we're talking about body friendly language and so in the body friendly language there are the invitations slash instructions um there are also certain presuppositions that are within each invitation within each instruction yeah which is actually what makes it so tricky for leading groups and leading group meditations as to every instruction every invitation we give will fit for some people yeah. and will not fit for others yeah absolutely um and so, well, can I ask you then, Lucas, that um, <laughs> your interest in bringing your somatic kind of work together with parts mm -hmm. work, um, mm -hmm. where, where are you at in terms of the body-friendly language? What, what is it you're trying to figure out precisely? Or So, um, within that, there are multiple elements of the body-friendly language. So number one, in my teaching, that I always guide certain meditations in the beginning of calls. And I've been exploring and questioning how to do that most uh, elegantly, most cleanly, but at the same time, in a way that is both instructive for people so that the meditations can actually give them certain tools they can use for themselves and for others. And that's been a tension field for me on how to word all of those things, how to, how to word things like, is it okay? 
and if you want to, and I invite you, and all of those things in the in the guided meditations. Mm-hmm. So that's that's one. Um, another one is that I have within the the kind of parts work I am both guiding in my sessions, but also teaching in the courses. I have a lot of small micro agreements and body, and I would say body friendly, body oriented questions. So for me, everything in the parts work I teach will start with um, what are you noticing? And noticing can be more thoughts, it can be feelings, it can be sensations, it can be within the body, around the body, can be over there, whatever. I'm totally open and I don't give people anything. What are you noticing in your body or what are you noticing in your feet in this place? But as we explore experience, there will, because it's what I teach and it's what I do, there will be a place where once we find something that is challenging for people and that they want to explore, I will ask, is it okay to call this a part or to relate to this as a part? And that's a very fundamental question for me in this. Is it okay that we do that? We, we don't even know if it is. Like I don't say, is this a part? Or is it okay to say this is a part, but to relate to it as a part or call it a part? Mm-hmm. Which for me, it took me a while to get those distinctions clear because I found it has a very different effect on people if I ask, is that a part? Or if, if I ask, is it okay to call that a part? Because the call that a part still has the possibility of maybe as we call it a part, we find out it's not a part. And actually that's something that's really important also in how I hold that within myself. I want to have that openness, that I am giving a clear structure because most people who come to me have not yet done lots of parts work. So in me asking that question, is it okay to call that a part? I am giving structure. Mm -hmm. And at the same time, I want to see if that structure is okay for them. Mm -hmm. And I want to be open enough so that even if we both say, yes, let's relate to that as a part, Mm -hmm. maybe five minutes later, we find out it's, it's just something weird you ate in your stomach. And then, we don't have to stick to it being a part, but we can say, okay, yeah, we, we related to it as a part, but it wasn't really one. And then we can return to openness. That's what I was going to ask. How do you know if it's not a part? I don't. But I mean, how does that, how, how, what kind of, or how do you know it is a part? What, what's the definition? What, what, what agreement do you come to with a client that, oh yeah, this is actually a part? So for me, the and again, the, whether we know it's a part will come down to we relate to it as a part and then we start exploring. And in the exploration, number one, if it is a part, it will become more and more 3D in a way. So that even though in the beginning it was just this tension, as we turn towards the tension, and that's again, body-friendly language, is it okay to turn your awareness towards that well, that yeah, body friendly language, indeed, yes, yeah, and Not mindfulness language, you could say, yeah, 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 um, and then usually, if it's a part, we will we will get to know different elements of it. It's oh, as we turn the attention towards, there's not just the uh, this is a bit scary, but we'll get a thought along with it, and we'll get a, another sensation, and we get a picture, and so this will kind of flesh itself out, and. Sometimes that just doesn't happen. Sometimes we relate to it, but, hmm. and then it might still be a part, mm-hmm. but we don't get access to it right now. And then it's important for me as the facilitator to also not uh, cling on to it too much, but to see that as a, syst- as, a, as a symbol also from the system saying, maybe this is not the path. So it is, it's a collaborative deciding whether we keep relating to that as a part. And then there are certain questions we will ask it where we start not just asking about the experience of it, but actually asking the experience to respond to us. And that's usually where it gets most um, most clear that it is a part or that it is not a part. So where we will ask, and what is this scared part worried about? And see, does the response come from the part? And people can tell 
even people who are not trained in it, they kind of get, oh, this is just my, my mind saying that. And usually they can then see that's coming from a different part within their kind of experiential space. And sometimes it's coming from exactly the place we've been talking about. So that, that's kind of how, how we determine. And I, it's never me saying, yes, 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 that is a part. Mm -hmm. It's always the collaboration with the client seeing, hmm, does this seem to be a part or not? Mm -hmm. In a sense, maybe does, does it have a mind of its own? In, in one way, yes. I, I look at parts in one way as um, we don't just have one, one consciousness that is, or one self, as many psychological traditions would have called it, where it's just, this is who we are. But we have different elements within that. And I actually, my experience is that these parts, these elements have a consciousness of their own that's not split, but that can have different information and different imprints and different outlooks at, at life than other parts, and maybe than me right now. Yeah, and the so how does the, the body-friendly language that, and the actual body work flow from, from that? So body-friendly language as in for me, the is it okay would be already some body, fr body friendly language. It's the can you turn your awareness towards that, but it's also it goes much further than that in the way I explore the parts is very and can you it's always these small steps and as you relate to it like that, there's a lot of kind of somatic energetic re negotiation constantly is this okay what are you drawn to, which I would consider very much, they're often questions that for me, at least people can only answer from their embodied space of, is it okay? Yes. Uh, which one are you drawn to? Um, but then also for me, one tool I use a lot are small experiments mm -hmm. where we will relate to the part and I will set a container that is a small experiment, a little bit inspired by the Hakomi experiments. Um, I don't know if you've ever heard of them. I find them very, very skillfully done mm -hmm. mindfulness exercises where it's, we'll have a small experiment that will just take a few minutes, but within that, we will try something out. We will try to relate to something in a certain way. For me, it's often, can you try to place your hand where the part is in your body? Can you breathe with the part? Can you um, just be with it? And those will be small experiments. Mm -hmm. Again, set up in a, at least for me, trying to be as body friendly as possible way. And then from that, going back to, and what happens then? What happens to you? What happens to the part? How is the relationship between you then? But having done that after that short experiment. Yes, yes, uh, certainly. Um, I use that kind of experimental approach as well, just asking, would it be okay just to do a little experiment with that? Yeah. Um, no, that, that all sounds fascinating in terms of how the body-friendly language helps, I guess, just sitting here right now with, with my own sense of what's going on with this conversation. It's like, well, there's a lot of words, and it's very interesting mm -hmm. um, to talk to somebody else who's doing the same kind of thing. And it's like my body is just sitting here saying, well, what about me? <laughs> mm -hmm. You're talking about body friendly language, but why can't we actually bring the body into this mm -hmm. conversation? And I saw, okay, so that you could say that's maybe a part of me, the body partly me saying come into the conversation so uh, if i say okay let's um let's see what happens then what what does happen that that's the question and i would love to explore that my body right now tells me i need to turn up the heating and i will quickly do that it takes about 10 seconds i'll be right back so maybe if you are up for it we could have a small exploration right now bringing the body into it a tiny bit.
Yeah. Uh, who knows what would happen because we we're, we're not in a client therapist situation. No. But so if we yeah if if we call this an experiment, yes. um, then and I listen to my body and y you maybe help me listen to my body for a minute. Mm -hmm. Let's see how that. And what is my body telling me about this conversation? So yes. first thing that happens for me is it just says, shut up. <laughs> <laughs> and listen, shut up and listen. Um, and, and is it okay to stay with shut up and listen for a moment? Yes, and especially okay for me to have that permission from you um, mm. and for you to inquire in that gentle and respectful way. And um, so what happens next? And it's just a sort of sense that my, yeah, my whole embodied self says, I, I want to be present more in this conversation. Mm. Um, and it just starts reminding me of how I would be present in a conversation with a, a client or anyone who wanted to explore something with me helping them. This is how I would be present. Slower speech, less in my head trying to think of what I should say next to you know, keep the podcast going. Um, more open, literally open here to that sense of connection even on a zoom screen it's just you know just as powerful so the the, the thing right now is just be open to your sense of connection with whatever is is there in the field it doesn't have a name it's not like lucas or anything it's just be open to your sense of whatever is there in the field mm -hmm. And when you take a moment to listen and express what your body wants, how is that for your body? Well, that's like, um, it's like um, in an Aston Martin, <laughs> there's a huge sense of power behind me, actually. Um, power in a... Um, Yeah, that's actually, that was a surprise. That arm, that forward movement was a surprise. I would have thought it would be more like a depth to it or a solidity to it. But actually, this is kind of mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> down there. Uh, I did mention the lower back earlier. It's sort of, yeah, a real oomph, some kind mm -hmm. of energy that, that seems to, boom, yeah, I want to go forward. Mm. Yeah, a real oomph mm. forward. And when there is oomph and forward, how is that for you? Well, it is me. <laughs> ah. <laughs> <laughs> um, and, I, and in my head, I'm just trying to figure out what, what is that all about? What, what forward? What's that forward? What's that? You know, where's that oomph coming from? Um, and your question was, how is that for me? And the surprising answer, yeah, is, it is me. Yeah. Um, and it relates very much to work I'm doing at the moment and transitions I'm trying to go through in terms of, I guess you could say, in terms of getting this work out to a wider group of people who appreciate it and want to work that way, which is what you're doing too. But the, yeah, so the oomph is, is a kind of, um, um, let's get this party started. <laughs> and, and is it okay if we just take a moment and kind of stay with that oomph? Mm. Because I am curious, speaking from that oomph, what is the work you want to bring? You want to bring out this. Um, 
I, I may re refer the, the <laughs> listener to the previous conversation we had. <laughs> um, but it's, I guess, talking to you now, Lucas, because you're such a good listener and you understand what I'm talking about. It's about, um, there's something aesthetic about it. The, the word, you know, it's the beautifulness of, of how language can bring us, not just to the body, but through that embodied connection to the beautifulness of this person, the, the whoever it is that's there in front of us. And that certainly relates, you know, for me, that relates to kind of Zen principles of just that beginner's mind. When, when we talk about beginner's mind, I think there are, there are a few aspects. I don't want to go too much into, again, back into cognitive analysis and stuff, but beginner's mind, as used by Suzuki, Shinru Suzuki, when he's, you know, in, in that book, Zen Mind, Beginner's Mind, talks about it. Sometimes he talks about it just as a, a more everyday way of talking about awakening or enlightenment. Sometimes he talks about it as the freshness of a child coming to something that they haven't done before, that childlike delight and willingness to explore. Um, but also I think there's another ingredient to beginner's mind, which is you can have as a grown up as well, which is the awesomeness of things, <laughs> which again, a lot of people relate to Zen in that sense that, wow, this is, a, I'm having a, Zen moment, having a moment of awesomeness. And I sometimes think like when, if you're a, the, using the metaphor of a painter and a painted portrait of someone, the person who's sitting for the portrait, the painter who's painting the portrait. You can be a painter who just does a mechanical job of accurately representing something. Or if you're a real master, then you're summoning everything from within your talents, abilities, experience, and depth of self. You're summoning all of that to be in present with this person whose image you're trying to depict. And what you're trying to do is bring the reality of that person as you see them into the image. And it's deep stuff. And anytime you go to a gallery or, you know, look at them, the works of these masters uh, um, is, is intensely moving and powerful. And that, that's what we try to rep reproduce in working with a client, I think. What is, you, know, I, you can never pretend that the way you see the client, the way you experience them, however deep or awesome it is, is, is their authentic self. It's only how you are experiencing their authentic self in this shared field between you. But that's the, um, there are moments when you can just be in that and um, then you know you're getting somewhere, I guess. So obviously, that question you just asked me about how is that for you is a kind of an invitation for the person as they experience this field to attempt to integrate that with their cognitive mind, their everyday mind, the self that they are in all the different roles that they play in everyday life. How can I bring that authenticity more into my real everyday life? <laughs> it's a short answer to your question. <laughs> so very, very short and not at all broad. Um, but no, it's an end. And what I hear is the you being as awake and present as you can be. And in that awake presence, yeah. being with the other and actually bringing that same presence to them and in that having that awesomeness, that awe for them and the unfolding fabric of the connection. And that I hear what you want to bring to the world is 
your own take on what might help to create that in session settings with people? Yes, how can we use language and body awareness, somatic awareness, to facilitate that work? And yeah. in, in pure body work, like in Zen Shiatsu for me, whatever it might be for you, um, when the person lies down, they stop talking, you begin to connect at a much different or deeper level. And um, I remember doing this as a project when I, in my third year of training in Shiatsu, I, I just took before and after photographs of people's faces after, before the Shiatsu and after. And, uh, you know, the face afterwards was quite different. You, there was, oh, there's the real person. And um, so when, when you let go of language and a, a person is in a safe space to really just become themselves, somatically as well as in every other way then then it's there it's not a, it's not really a problem to reach it in that way the 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 challenge is i think you were talking to mark walsh about this a bit is how do we bring that into how do we integrate that into our normal everyday life and um and that's where the language comes in that's where the clean language can help us connect the right side of the brain to the left side of the brain. The, the left side being the side that sort of tends to be the gatekeeper and the, the one that runs everyday life and so on. Um, yeah, that, that's, that's what I'm aiming to do is just bring clean language and this body friendly awareness to the process. Mm. What, what I find really fascinating as a question in that, which connects back to, and we've, we've gone off in, into the deep end again. <laughs> we started with body friendly language and now we're, but the, the Zen element of it. Mm. And my experience, not with Zen in particular, but with, uh, awakening oriented practices and awakening oriented uh, retreats and similar is the connection to this deepest sense of who we really are mm -hmm. and what that might be when the layers and shells and all of that are either peeled or have melted or have been penetrated, or I think there are different kinds of experiences that we can have that give us an, a glimpse of that Zen. Uh, and I experience it in sessions as a, the more I can be connected to that in me or rooted to that in me, I have completely different resources than when I'm trying to figure things out or trying to do the right thing. And the more a client in a session can connect to self, as I would call it in the IFS model, in themselves, uh, sessions will just naturally take the twists and turns that are helpful. And I don't have to figure it out. And in one very fascinating way, they don't have to figure it out. But there is a deeper level of reality that actually guides us in that. And I find that that guiding force is very often not a cognitive force, but could be much more rooted in the body and the wider awareness that can come with resting in that body and field yes the deeper level of reality as you say uh it's definitely not cognitive and it's definitely has something to do with the with somatic presence and i guess the um 
I, I'm reminded that when the when they were starting to develop mindfulness-based cognitive therapy, these um, the the people who figured it out were psychologists, and they went off to John Kabat-Zinn to learn how you teach it, and they sort of came back with it as a script, and they started working with clients, uh, patients. Um, who were prone to depression and sort of almost as if they were delivering as a script and it didn't work. And it, then they realized that, oh, we have to do mindfulness too. And it's the same with, with this body friendly stuff. That the more you make it a regular practice to listen to your own body, uh, also to do your own parts work, obviously, in terms of what you're doing, the more the, the, the presence that you bring is an invitation to the other person's somatic presence to come into the space. And again, you have to be extremely careful with that because it can be a surprise or a shock um, for a person when they suddenly discover that they are somatically present. You know, the, the cognitive mind has to catch up with that or to make sure that it's okay or to try to control it in some way oh my heart is really pumping away here I don't know what's going on you know uh, it can be challenging so um we the body friendly language includes a lot of ways to back off a lot of ways to remind the client to put the brakes on that they have the power to put the brakes on themselves regulation as you say um and in the in the real business of practice that's what we're really doing i mean yes i can talk about the awesomeness of, and the beauty of the, the authentic self you only get there by being really willing to put the brakes on really willing to listen to your own neuroceptions of what's going on and you know yeah. what's going on for the other person so how do you find that works in your practice um so in two ways i find that actually three i imagine so number one i think it has a lot to do with me genuinely not pushing and me genuinely not wanting to get anybody anywhere and being totally okay with resistance, distraction, all of the things that are often looked at as, oh, something's going wrong. Yeah. Actually having a real sense and understanding and knowledge and knowledge, not in the cognitive, but in the deep, deeply rooted within me of this is perfect. Th yeah. There's nothing I need to change about this. Yeah. That's why I call it trauma friendly rather than trauma sensitive. Yeah, you have to be trauma sensitive and then be trauma friendly, mm -hmm. be delighted, be, be welcoming. This is that, that sort of more childlike yeah. aspect of the beginner's mind. Oh, this is fantastic. This is delightful. This is intriguing. Bring curiosity. Yeah. yeah. So, um, and from the parts perspective, this is the second one. There is the, there is the mantra and it is kind of a mantra of all parts are welcome. Mm. And that means that no matter what happens in a session, we, we might be at the, at the place where my take on, oh, what's going on here is, oh, we're right before the big reveal, the big thing, and then something different happens. Yeah. And it's so easy to then be like, oh, can we just get rid of that so we can continue here? But actually, all parts are welcome. And this part will have some reason why it is coming up right now. Absolutely, yeah. And then also having the skills on a parts work level to include that, but also on a body level, because most parts that come up do have some somatic uh, expression. Some parts are mm -hmm. very much cognitive and they don't really have a deep expression on the, on the soma, but most parts do. There is suddenly a different feeling, a different sensation, a different nervous system state and that is also not just welcoming the part cognitively yes yes you are welcome but actually on the somatic level being like all of that that's happening right now is welcome yeah y you're you're in fight flight now great and 
maybe it's even okay to just stay with that because it could be really interesting to see where this is coming from and what this fight flight wants. And maybe the fight flight is too much for your system right now. And then we can also find a way to potentially find more regulation. Great. But having that welcoming of the, of the embodied energies and of the survival energies that are in the body the welcoming of it exactly yes and and if so probably a lot of people watching this uh, are working therapeutically one way or another with people i i think that's the thing that we underestimate in our work is simply the the allowing a thing to be there because a person in everyday life, as I say, they're suffering from anxiety and they, or they, you know, their the breathing gets very constricted or something day to day. Um, and that's not a nice thing to be happening. They come to you and they want to get rid of it. But actually, as you say, the first step is, is it okay just to, to allow that to be there? In, uh, and, and also including when it's not okay for that to be there that is that it is totally okay of course for of it course. to not be okay <laughs> of course because it's yeah. a question and it's again yeah. handing it back to them and um if they say no then you kind of can offer the experiment of some graduated approach to it or whatever um but we often as you say we think there's the big reveal is just coming and we want to get on to it but this thing about just allow that to be there in this safe space and that part then discovers, oh, wow, I'm in a safe space. I can behave differently. And uh, again, as you say, the system, the intelligence of the system and how it wants to heal itself um, has space in which to start doing things differently, to e explore the possibility of doing things differently. Yeah. And I, I, yeah. I find that also... For me, that is one of the core overlaps between the kind of different models that I, I have learned and that I use and that I use to orient. But it's that system has its own intelligence and its own impulse towards healing. Yeah. And I find that comes from the bodywork perspective. So the shiatsu, or in my case, more the Thai perspective of there is life energy. Mm. And the life energy actually wants to live. That, that, that's part of it. And it will have its natural uh, imprint of wholeness if we allow it to flow. Yeah. It's, it's the, the trauma nervous system perspective of each kind of level of our nervous system, each survival pattern of our nervous system is, has the impulse and the positive intent of helping us survive. And actually each, and at the same time, the whole nervous system is geared to try and return towards regulation. And actually it has its own path if we can follow it in small enough steps. Mm. And each part in us, which would be the parts perspective, has a positive intent for the system. And the clean perspective would be that the whole system and within it kind of encoded within each metaphor, there is a, there is a path towards unfolding and i find that that trust we, trusting that trusting that there is a deeper wisdom at work that can really guide us and that i for me personally that is i think the without that i wouldn't know what to do because without that, I would think I have to figure it out. And I know very well that I can't. That any client, any situation is way too complex for me to try and figure it out. Yeah. And the Zen principle of it being okay to not know is, is really very, very important. Um, absolutely. So another thing I was doing just to prepare for this was looking back at ericksonian hypnotherapy basic principles of that and erickson himself uh, was a very unusual individual uh, he had polio twice and had to recover from that and retrain his body twice to do that he was 
dyslexic, he was tone deaf. He experienced the world, you know, in ways that are not normal. Um, and that gave him, I think, a, a, a good start in just this willingness to experience everybody as unique. And so that first principle, each person is absolutely unique and we really need to crank up our curiosity rather than settle back into that lazy thing of how is this person like me? Actually, how are they doing their own thing in utterly unique ways? And the second principle is what they call it in Ericksonian work, utilization, which I guess in a Zen way he just says, what is happening right now? And how can we bring that in? How can we use that? What is this person offering me from their uniqueness? What are they offering me as a way to begin the conversation? So rather than imposing a model or an idea of what we should be doing, you, you take whatever is offered it's, in it's the, the behavior. Yeah. yeah, it's the distinction that I think I picked up from Peter Ralston, who's a crazy dude. I, I like crazy dudes, uh, but his his big distinction is exclusion versus inclusion. Mm -hmm. That whenever we try to get rid or remove something, we try to exclude it. Mm -hmm. But the only sustainable way to deal with whatever is challenging us within ourselves, within our world, is to include it and actually make the system bigger. So, yeah. And that's, again, that's come back to that, having a safe space and somebody who's there who's actually interested in helping you do that. And yeah. in a way, that's that's all we do. And um, it's so important. The, there's a lovely quote I've got here from John O'Donoghue, uh, poets are people who become utterly dedicated to the threshold where silence and language meet. And... When I read that, I thought, you know, that really resonated. Um, but not, it's the site, the, for me, it's where the body and where language meet. This is the kind of work uh, that, that I'm interested in, is to be utterly dedicated to that place where language meets the body. And then what happens? Mm -hmm. mm. Yeah. Not so, because the body, sorry, not because the body is, a, is the be-all and end-all, the place where it all happens, but because the body is a kind of threshold to a different kind of awareness, that deeper reality you were talking about before that is yeah. way beyond the cognitive. But when the more time we spend there and the more skillfully we can be present there, the more it comes back to the cognitive mind to help the cognitive mind evolve and become more sophisticated in, in its ways of encountering this awesome reality, which we are part of every day. Yeah. And, and I think that's also where this distinction between the body and the soma or the distinction between the, the body and in German, it would be the light. Yes. Um, I think is important because it's not just, it's not just the body. It's actually the, the, body infused with spirit mm. and that it's that body being that uh, yeah so th that that is the interesting one lucky in german that you have that word because yeah. i i try not to use the word body these days because it has it just takes people in the wrong direction you can say body mind but it doesn't really work very well in english um the the, yeah. the 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 word in English I found is also again from Peter Ralston. He calls it the body being. Yeah, that, that I actually find that describes it well. It, it does, but in English we're not allowed to stick words together the way you are. <laughs> True, <laughs> it's just very natural for yeah. me. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, anyway, um, and and as other? we're maybe moving yeah. towards closing this down soon. Um, I would love to maybe return to the beginning mm. of this conversation because now we've opened a whole lot of uh, big, big pots of trusting the system, the being, yeah. the deeper reality. How does that relate back to body-friendly language? Um, well, how does that relate back to body-friendly language? It, 
it comes back to that thing about Stephen Porges and prosody, the, the sense that the language that we use professionally is coming from an embodied place, is resonating in, in the field of awareness. It's not just coming from the, the what should I say next? What question should I ask next? Place. And, and that's really, that's really what body friendly language is. It, it's friend, if the more friendly you are to your own body as the professional practitioner, the more the language that comes out will fit, will be right. Um, and that's as much as you can do with language. I guess we should put that in as a final thing that language can only go so far. And, uh, and wo über man nicht sprechen kann, da über muss man schweigen, ja? What you can't speak of, one has to be silent of. Yeah. Or as I like to say, oh, what you can't speak about, you do shiatsu about. The, <laughs> there are other, other places, other things you can do beyond language. And so... The, yeah, that's a, another way, I guess, to think about body-friendly language. Is it's it's a it's a, a diving board. It's a, it's only there for us to walk along it and jump into the swimming pool and experience what it's like to really be in the water. That's mm -hmm. a metaphor. <laughs> uh, I almost I almost caught that one. Um, okay. <laughs> <laughs> I I. I would maybe add two thoughts I have and see if that resonates with you. Because for me, I find that body-friendly language is about how I am with my body, but it's also how easily and smoothly I can invite the other person to connect to their own life, to their own body being. And... I find that the, the cleaner in that sense I am with my invitations, the, the more easily those invitations can be accepted and not accepted in the sense of, yes, I do that, but in the sense of, I try that. Mm -hmm. I am open to taking that, mm -hmm. that step. So I find that for me, that is really where it's so important to be friendly towards the other human's system and to invite it. And the more I can invite it openly, we can actually get to this place of, and now we both don't know what's going to happen. Yeah. And that's, and for me, that's the place where the magic happens is when we're both in the place of now we both don't know. Yeah. Then the magic happens. Yes, yeah. absolutely. Now, I, I like the word parts because it reminds me of, um, Shakespeare's all the world's a stage and every man and woman is a player and when you're an actor you have a part mm -hmm. and if you're right in a film or a play it's like just what you said it, before the big reveal something else suddenly comes in that's real playwriting or film writing that's real script writing it's not allow the big reveal and then you can go home it's oh suddenly something else has come in you are constantly being open to being surprised to being ready to go with what what actually arises and yeah and that's where the magic happens <laughs> that's where the magic happens maybe that's actually the place to end this for today isn't it so that's just a good place to finish. And if anybody's still listening, <laughs> that, then um, congratulations. You, you get a medal. Uh, yes. Thanks. Thanks, Lucas. And it's so fascinating to explore these things in a like-minded way and like-bodied way. And um, what, yeah. Yeah, what also fascinates me is that talking about this we can't just conceptually talk about it because mm. even, even these, we could have obviously talked about, and there is this phrase and you could say, 
are you open to? And you, we could say, are you okay with? And we could, but all these phrases, all the questions, all the words are just a, a tool and a pointer towards the way we interact with ourselves, our, our clients, and the, the mystery that's happening right now. So talking about the language, we get to the mystery and then we can maybe connect that back to the language, but it's, that's actually what we're talking about. We're not talking so much about the language. We're talking about how we can point and relate to that unfolding weird mystery. The mystery. Yeah. The diving in to the pool. Yes. <laughs> Or the dipping the toe into the pool sometimes. The toe into the pool, yes. <laughs> Depending on the temperature of the water. Okay. I really don't like cold water. Okay. <laughs> Thank you very much, Nick. Okay, Lucas. Um, mind how you get around the next one.